I'm Tracy, this is The Sewing Channel. Enough talking already. Number one, right out the gate. I don't put water in my iron for quilt projects anymore. I really don't steam press anything anymore where it involves quilting. Steam gets really hot in our irons. Mix that with water and you're going to cause shrinkage and you're going to cause your fabric and your squares that you just cut out and sewed together to distort. It's just a fact. An alternative that I use instead of steam pressing is a water spritz bottle. They're a real inexpensive way to just add a spritz of water on your project just to get it to lay how you want it to. And when you pair that with a dry iron, success. I no longer use a regular ironing board to press all of my quilting fabric pieces. I was totally in when I discovered wool mats. This wool mat is a bit special. It has wool mat on one side and then it has a cutting station on the other side, which is perfect for me because I make YouTube videos, but any quilter can benefit from this mat. I also have a pressing station that's on wheels. Now you would never guess it, but there are definitely wool mats underneath that thin piece of cotton. The main benefit of a wool mat for a quilter, when you heat the top, it sends heat to the bottom of the wool and brings it right back up. So it's kind of like pressing both sides at once. That's efficient. Number three, I stopped winging it at the sewing machine and sewing whatever seam allowance I felt like sewing or thinking that it just didn't matter. When I first started quilting, I didn't know that you were supposed to pay attention to the seam allowance. I mean, really pay attention to it. Not paying attention to the seam allowance I often wondered, what went wrong? Why is that so different? Why doesn't that add up? Why is that longer than that piece? Well, let me tell you, it's real simple. When you start paying attention to your seam allowance, you really start to see why things looked so bad. In the example that I'm showing you on the screen right now, I used my metal guide to set up my seam allowance so that it gave me a quarter inch seam allowance. And that's a quarter inch from that edge to the needle. Well, even then you have to check it because you'll see in the video here, my seam allowance on my Juki is just a little bit bigger than it needs to be. But that's okay because I don't use that metal guide really. I use the edge of the foot, which is the scant quarter inch to really sew all my projects. It's just easier that way for me. In this example, you can really see the difference that a quarter inch makes and a scant quarter inch makes. So you could be at your sewing machine and take a little bit of seam allowance or medium or a lot of seam allowance. And if you don't sew the same seam allowance in the entire project, you're gonna come out all crazy. So if you're trying to match things up and you're noticing that, wow, that row is longer than that row and you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, you're probably not really checking your seam allowance like you should be. I kind of gave away number four in number three. <laughs> Truth be told, I never, ever, ever sewed a true quarter inch seam allowance when I first started quilting. Friends, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> now, in my quilting, I sew a scant quarter inch. I just tell myself ahead of time, I'm going to do a scant quarter inch every single time. I know if I follow the edge of my presser foot with my fabric, things are gonna go good. On to number five, which is on the same subject. I never worried about being consistent. Friends, I worry now about being consistent with my seam allowance. So a fat quarter inch, medium quarter inch, scant quarter inch, just be consistent and be mindful of that consistency. Number six, if you've been around here for a while, you know I get super excited about different projects and especially starting a new project. That excitement gets me into trouble sometimes. When I finish up a quilt project, I'm done with it. I wanna move on to the next episode and quick. What that does is leave a whirlwind. Like the Tasmanian devil just went through my sewing room and I'm not kidding you. <laughs> it gets so crazy when you have a small sewing space 
So I don't just shove stuff in corners now and in piles when I'm done with a sewing project. I actually clean up my entire room before I start a new quilt project. That doesn't only help just to have a clean space, it helps my creativity because when I'm cluttered around me, I can't think and I know that about me. So once my sewing room has a clean slate, you better believe I'm ready to go and I'm gonna hit the ground running. Number seven is probably the most irritating thing that I used to do that I don't do anymore. And I only did it because other quilters told me to do it and it was like a thing. Well, let me tell you, it's not my thing. When I first started quilting, everyone told me that you don't need to backstitch. No, no, you don't need to backstitch. Why are you backstitching on quilting? Oh my word. Well, guess what? I wish they didn't tell me that because I had so much frustration back in the day. My seams would come apart, right? And that means I myself unraveled because it was a consistent coming apart because I handled my quilt top so much. When you're new at quilting, you don't know what you don't know. You listen to what everyone tells you, right? Well, they said don't backstitch, so I didn't, which meant major headaches. I'm the type of quilter, I don't like to redo anything, especially a seam that I've already sewn. <laughs> it's a no brainer for me. I think quilters tell you that because other quilters told them that, but honestly, backstitch. Otherwise you're gonna pull your hair out. <laughs> and yes, there are times where you really don't need to backstitch. In those cases, it would be something like you're sewing it up real quick, you're not handling it too much, you're like sewing and sewing and one and done. You know that you're going to be finishing up that seam right then and there. In those cases, yeah, I can see. Or chain piecing, you know you just want to get it going and get it done because you're going to sew those pieces right away into a block. I'm not sure how long I continued on not backstitching. There was a point in my quilting where I was like, this is crazy, I'm backstitching and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> so now I tell all you, backstitch, backstitch, backstitch. You go ahead, you backstitch. And I'll say it again, backstitch. <laughs> I may make some quilters mad by saying that, but oh well, it is what it Leads is. Leads me to number eight. I never took the time to stay stitch around my quilt top. Now regardless, if you sew the back stitch, right? Like I just talked about in number seven. When your quilt top's done, you typically look at it and you may square things up. But when you square things up, guess what? You are slicing off where you back stitched. But that's okay, because that is what a stay stitch is for around the entire quilt top. Now I use about a three millimeter, I think it is, stitch length. And I typically will just zoom it real quick around the quilt top and done. That way when I go to baste my quilt together, I'm not worried about if my side seams are gonna come undone because I squared it a certain way or whatnot. So keep that in mind that stay stitching is okay too. <laughs> Don't not do that like I did, do that. Number nine, I never start a quilt project or especially a free motion quilting project unless I have every single bobbin that I own wound. <laughs> you see friends, I lose every time at bobbin chicken or chicken bobbin or whatever they call that game that they all play out there. I lose at it every time. And let me tell you, there's nothing worse <laughs> than losing at that chicken bobbin and not having one ready to go in your machine the minute it happens. If I have to stop what I'm doing to wind a bobbin, mm -mm -mm. it's not gonna be good. <laughs> See, I never used to do that. I would always lose at bobbin chicken and have to stop and wind, and I would be sitting there as I was winding, whining, <laughs> thinking to myself, why didn't I just wind them before all this? Why go through all this? So yeah. Now I do that. <laughs> Number 10, I never took the time to match up row seams. 
Now friends, there are times when it doesn't really matter or count, but there are those times where you need to match up your rows together by the seams. And you know what? I would just start at one end and so thinking, oh yeah, everything's gonna come together just fine. Well, guess what? It doesn't <laughs> ever matter if you press your seams open or to one side. You need to make sure that that seam matches up with the next row, their seam. Hope that makes sense. When you're first starting out quilting, you don't think of those things. Go one step further, pop some pins within those seam areas before you sew it to the next row. So that way everything sews up as good as it possibly can sew up. Here's a fun fact for you. I sleep with this quilt right here every single night. 10 down and 10 more to go. I have to take this half time within this video to thank my viewers from the bottom of my heart for taking advantage of my newest pattern right here. I appreciate the support from you more than you know. Now on to the next 10. Number 11. You have a block that has multiple seams going around it and meeting right in the center. There's a special trick that you can utilize to make sure that they all match up and meet right in the center. I never utilized this trick back in the day, but you better believe it, I use it now. Watch this clip so you can learn this trick. You will thank me. The trick Trust here, me. when you get to this point, when you need to match this point up in the center. I put these together in four patches. That's the easiest for me. And then I go ahead and sew them together like rows. But here I just wanted to show you, we're going to match these two up right here. So I'm gonna flip those together. And you'll see there, just by lifting that up, it's gonna be really hard to match that up as a point in the center and we wanna get it as close as possible. So I'm gonna take my pin, and on this side here, you can see where that V shape is. It's probably an upside down V to you. It's right there. Find that center point where they meet up, right in the middle seam there. So I've put my pin through, and they're in between both of those two pinks right there, where it comes to the V shape. I'm going to then find the V shape point on this one, which is right there. You see where the V shape is? And then I'm going to just take my pin and go right in there like so. That pin right there is going to be the center of that point. While that's in there just like that, I'm then going to grab the end here, being sure that this is still staying right there in the center. You can see here that when I do that, this is not even up, but I need to sew it like that because otherwise I'll have a slanted block. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop a pin right there. And then I'm gonna come over here, still checking to make sure that that is indeed in center. Go ahead and pin this one over here, right in the center. Then I'm going to take this out and pop a pin right next to that seam, and then I'm gonna sew a quarter inch down. It's very important that you come in exactly at a quarter inch where that point is. That will ensure that in the end, everything's matching together. But let's see how we did. I'll go ahead and sew it. You can see there our quarter inch has been sewn on both sides. I have not looked to see if I made the point yet or not, so let's look together. Okay, very good. Oh, I love it when a plan comes together, right? Number 12. I no longer pre-wash my quilting fabric like I did when I first started. I thought you pre-washed your fabric because that's what I did when I would sew clothes and make skirts and such for myself or whoever. And I would always pre-wash because they said, oh, you know, because of shrinkage and all that. But quilting is totally different. The product the manufacturers use on the fabric is called sizing, and it's like a chemical I know, but that actually makes the fabric stiffer and a lot more easy to work with. Now, if you are very sensitive, you may be allergic to some of that stuff, and in that case, you would definitely pre-wash. But for me, 
my fabric comes right in from the store. I press it how I want it. Whether or not I'm going to starch it or not, I figure all that out, cut it, sew it. And when the quilt is all done, I always, 100% of the time, wash it prior to giving it to the recipient. It just makes sense to me because when I would wash like 50 yards of fabric for quilting, oh my word, there were strings all over the place and they were caught together and they were all tied in knots and oh, no thank you. Me pre-washing my quilting fabric, that was very short-lived to say the least. Number 13 is really recent for me of something that I don't do anymore. When I started sewing, I would buy rulers that were, you know, at the store, whatever they had. The thing was, these rulers always had this neon yellow line along the line. Well, I wear glasses, so that tells you that, yeah, my eyes are impaired at, to some point, but that yellow line <laughs> makes it way worse for me. <laughs> I don't know why they put that yellow line there. If someone knows, tell me in the comments. I recently upgraded my rulers to clear rulers. I know. This has been a long time coming. I put it off and put it off because they were just so expensive. And you know what? I wish that I would have purchased all of these clear rulers in the beginning. But at the time, I didn't know that I was going to be quilting for this long. So I bought a couple of these clear rulers to begin with to even see if it was a major difference. Oh my word. Is it a major difference? You better believe it is. I cannot believe what a difference it is. I was just telling one of my quilting friends that this was a game changer for me. I, I guess I didn't realize how much I struggled looking through that ruler with the yellow lines on it. I mean, how bizarre is that yellow line? I mean, I'm not sure why they do it. Why wouldn't you make it crystal clear so that you can literally see what you're measuring? I don't know. It's just one of those things, I guess. But I'm on to them, and I'm going to be getting rid of all of those yellow-lined rulers. Now, number 14, I didn't not do this too far into the beginning of my quilting. And that was putting on a clear command hook on all of my rulers. This arthritis is no joke. And when you're serious about quilting, you need to keep things very simple. This hook allows me to lift and maneuver my rulers in any direction at any time. It's just another one of those no-brainer things. We're number 15 already. At the beginning of my quilting journey, everyone said cotton thread, cotton thread, cotton thread. Well, I used cotton thread and I hate cotton thread. <laughs> it's true. It was trial and error though. I always felt like there was something wrong with the cotton thread as it was being sewn through my sewing machine. I'm not against cotton thread really. I'm not. And if you use it, that's awesome. And if it works for you, awesome. But it did not work for me, let me tell you. Cotton thread seemed to have a drag within my sewing machine, and I didn't like that feeling as I was sewing. It didn't feel smooth. And I collected a lot of fuzz that I had to maintain and clean and, you know, all that. And I don't like that either. So I decided to try polyester. Polyester thread for me personally was a game changer, not only when it came to piecing my quilt tops, but to free motion quilting as well. So if you're having problems like I was, go ahead, give it a try. It just might work for you. Another thing I no longer do in quilting is use any size needle with any random size weighted thread. It's totally true. You need to make sure that you are using the right size needle with the right size weighted thread. I'm gonna pop a chart here for you so that you can literally see what you need for what. I really do think that following this chart right here will solve half of the sewing issues that people do have. 17, I don't buy 15 needles and 15 different threads. At the beginning when I started quilting, I bought all the needles and I bought all the threads. Can I tell you friends, in my quilting life right now, I use one style needle and one style thread. 
to do everything in my sewing room. Now, of course, if I'm sewing knit, I'm going to use a ballpoint or a stretch needle and thread that goes with that. But for almost 99% of what I do, it's cotton piecing into quilts and my thread is polyester and then my needle is a titanium which will last longer in your sewing machine. Now friends, I'm not here to push any one brand of needle or any one brand of thread. I just really don't want to do that because I want you to get what works for you. But you need to know, you do not have to buy all this stuff, all these needles and all this thread, when really I do it with just one and one. Now, if you really wanna know what I use, you will have to look in the description box and check out those links. But once I found the combination that worked in my Juki sewing machine, it was over for me. I knew what I needed and I've never looked back and I've never had any issues. Number 18 on my list is not really talked about a lot, but it should be because it has to do with safety. During a sewing session, as you're sewing, you could be sewing for a pretty long time. And if you don't run across many problems during that session, you really don't think to check the screws on your sewing machine. The screw that holds the presser foot on, and the screw that holds the needle in place. This is important because our machines are very powerful. I know mine is. And that vibration causes those little screws to slide undone. Even if it's a very tiny hair bit undone, you need to check that and you need to tighten that up. I never used to check that. When I first started checking those little screws, I was amazed at how much that screw really does come unscrewed. So what you do is just stop what you're doing, check it, take your little screwdriver that you have and tighten up those screws. The safety part of it comes into play. If you never check that and you just keep your needle in, your needle could come loose and you know, you could break a needle, you could hurt your machine, you could hurt yourself. There's a lot that could go wrong. So it's just best practice to check those things. 19, we're almost done. When I first started quilting and I would put my quilt sandwich together before I actually quilted it, I would typically only use basting pins. Then I heard of 505 adhesive spray. I started using that. I absolutely love that spray. And that really worked for me. It really does adhere that batting with the quilt top and then the backing, but I still felt like it needed more. So I didn't start doing it this way, but I do it this way now. I not only spray base my quilt sandwich together, I also pin based all over the quilt, just in random spots, because you never know if something's going to come undone or maybe I didn't spray it that well and that spot comes undone. Well, at least if it's pinned in that spot, I know that that spot where it's pinned that's for sure the spot that needs to go together. <laughs> now that might seem overkill to you, but to me, that's called insurance. Before we get into number 20, any quilt that you saw in today's video, there's sure to be a tutorial on it and a pattern to go with it. So be sure to check that information box where I'll have all the things and all the links. This right here is my scrap wall of fame. Yes, I said fame, it's not the scrap wall of shame. I came up with this idea because I had scraps everywhere. I no longer wanted to just throw my scraps into bins that never got opened again and never saw the light of day. So I decided to color code some clear, you know, vinyl scrap bags and hang them on the wall. And yes, there's a tutorial on this too. So I never had these in the beginning, but I'm sure glad that I made them and I have them now. They not only contain all of my scraps by color, but every day when I walk into my sewing room, they inspire me to make a scrap quilt. They really do. <laughs> Until next time on the sewing channel, take care.